So we'll do some questions and answers. I will try to answer. If you ask me in French, I'll try. I may need some help. Bonsoir, Marc Poulin. Uh, Bonsoir. What about exchange rates, please? Uh, what about exchange rates? Yeah, because I'm not familiar with Bitcoins. And, uh, okay. So Bitcoin works exactly the same way as every other currency works, which means that um, Bitcoin is traded on international markets. It's traded at the moment against probably 35 to 40 different national currencies in real time and directly. Uh, but it's also affected by fluctuations between those currencies indirectly. So it's pretty much exchangeable for anything. Uh, if you can trade into 34 currencies, you can trade those into anything else. The exchange rate is defined by market dynamics, supply demand. Just like, you know, one day you wake up and the British pound is six percent lower. Well, you know, sometimes that happens in Bitcoin too. Actually, um, this year it's been the most um, successful and stable currency. <laughs> Um, so it's, it depends on the time of year you find it. You have to understand that Bitcoin is still a very small currency in terms of the fact that Bitcoin is a global currency from day one, but it's only ten billion dollars in size. Uh, so as a result, it has more volatility than uh, many of the currencies you are used to. So more volatility than the euro. Um, but what we've seen over the last seven years is that gradually the volatility is reduced over time. As it gets bigger, it gets bigger, more stable. Yes? Um, we have one question over here. I'll get right back to you. Yes? Hi, Andreas. Hello. Uh, it's a bit surreal for me to actually see you in person around five years back when I first got into Bitcoin and blockchain. Uh, your book, your articles, and your videos were a major source of information for me. Thank you. Uh, and I owe you, uh, and I, I'm sure I speak for other people over here as well, a big intellectual debt. Um, Thank you. <laughs> speaking of debt, <laughs> in the context of moving towards a cashless system, I think what we're seeing today is a certain kind of an impasse in which you have the possibility of creating uh, private cashless systems and public cashless systems, meaning fiat versus private systems. Yes. So private was you know, explored by Hayek, for example, in, in denationalization of currency. Uh, and I'm kind of trying to understand how can we reduce debt because from a macroeconomic perspective That's the big problem that we have today excessive amounts of debt build up mm -hmm. Which do you think is the better way to go should we go towards reducing fractional banking by having hundred percent reserves? Which would be you know if you have public money issued on a blockchain for example Or should we go towards private issuance of currency in order to counteract the buildup of debt? And that over overhang, of course. I think we're probably going to see both things happen, but they won't be precipitated by Bitcoin. They'll be precipitated by a fairly catastrophic collapse in debt, and that will happen simply because no one can pay. You know, the the bottom line is everyone's bankrupt, and when everyone's bankrupt, you can keep dancing around the chairs and pretending that you're not, <laughs> and then the music stops, and someone's left standing, and then the whole thing comes down. Um, I think we're living in an unprecedented time where you have 24 central banks that have set interest rates to zero, uh, debt uh, through the roof. We know how this was resolved in the past. Uh, we remember those events, you know, uh, calmly as World War One and World War Two. Uh, that's how we resolved debt in the past. I'm hoping this time we find a slightly better solution. Uh, but the, the bottom line is that is the big problem. Bitcoin is the little thing in the corner, and it's not going to solve anything right now. Um, it may allow some people to escape some of the ravages of debt and currency crisis. It already is doing that for a tiny, tiny fraction of the population in places like Venezuela and Argentina and Greece and Cyprus. Uh, but again, tiny, 0.001%. That's not going to save anyone. Um, and so, really, that's a question for economists, and it's outside of my particular area of expertise. I think it's a very bad situation. Over there, yes. Hi, Andreas. Thank you very much for the great speech. Thank you. Um, I have a question about Bitcoin governance. Mm -hmm. I would like to know your point of view about uh, establishing a fee market for Bitcoin, because I'm very concerned about. Uh, a transaction being uh, very easy for poor people and uh, having uh, very low fees for transact to transact uh, money over the over the world, and I know that there is a portion of the community that want to establish a fee market for Bitcoin, 
that could raise actually uh, fees for transferring money, transferring Bitcoin. I want to have your, this, your point of view on this subject. Thank you. So there is a fee market for Bitcoin now. There is a, there has been a fee market, and that fee market uh, was not important until uh, we reached the point where capacity was critical. And fee markets don't matter if you have unlimited capacity. And once you reach a point where capacity is constrained, then fee markets come into play. Um, fee markets are not a choice. Fee markets are not. Hey, shall we do a fee market or shall we not do a fee market? Uh, markets happen. And you can say, don't do a market, and markets will happen anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> fee markets will happen. And if you don't make a primary fee market, people are going to build a secondary fee market by using up all of the space and then reselling it in a fee market. <laughs> so, fee markets will happen whether you like it or not. The question is, how do we create the possibility of fulfilling transactions at much greater volume for people who can't afford? the current level of fees, or if it continues to rise. And the answer we seem to be arriving at is through the use of layers above Bitcoin. So secondary and tertiary layers above Bitcoin, the most promising of which at the moment is the Lightning Network, which is a system of bidirectional payment channels that are established with settlement into Bitcoin, but which allow a much, much higher rate of transactions, millions of transactions per second uh, in the order of millisecond uh, latency and uh, very very small um, fees. So those would enable not just micro transactions, but what I like to call nano transactions. So very very small transactions with very very small or no fees. Um, and then, if that gets used, we're going to have capacity problems, and then we're going to have to find another scaling solution. And if that gets used, we'll find another scaling solution. We keep doing that for 25 years. Will be as successful as the internet has in terms of continuously evolving to scale to the new applications. The problem you've got to understand, and this is something that most people find difficult to understand, um, the blockchain platform, specifically the Bitcoin blockchain, which is the highly secure, uh, very robust decentralized platform, is a very valuable commodity for applications. So if you have zero fees then everybody uses it to back up their computers directly onto the blockchain. Why not? Like I would back up my computer. I dump gigabytes on there. Great, fantastic. It's replicated internationally. There's an entire reward system to make sure that everybody keeps my data backed up forever. Um, and it's free. So what would happen? We'd use it to its full capacity. The fees make sure that it's not economical for such uses, um, which restricts its use a bit. Uh, but if you increase the capacity of the blockchain, the applications would expand to fill that capacity. So applications on the Bitcoin blockchain behave exactly like a gas. Do you remember physics? Gas always expands to fill the container, <laughs> and the blockchain is the container. So the applications. If you gave me a blockchain today and you said it can do a billion transactions, normal people would be, hmm. I don't know what we could use a billion transactions for. Computer engineers would be, huh, I wonder what I could use a billion transactions a second for. I know, and then write an application that does exactly that. Um, I once had someone ask me, do you really need a gigabit connection at home? D yeah. I'm a computer engineer. You give me a gigabit connection in 24 hours, I have it pegged at one gigabit up, one gigabit down, full time. You give me a 10 gigabit connection, I will make a backup of the entire internet. You give me a 100 gigabit connection, I will back up every VR, 3D, 4K, HD movie there ever is. And then serve it to the entire world and fill 100. There is no limit. No matter what capacity you create, an engineer will invent an application to fill it. So fee market is how you stop that from happening and how you basically say we have to make choices about which transactions are important or not. There is two ways to make choices. One is through authority and the other is through a market. Right? So authority says I think this is a good transaction and this isn't and you've got to decide who makes that decision. And the problem is they decide for everyone and that's not a very good way of doing it. A market-based solution says, if the person sending the transaction thinks it's worth paying a fee, then it's a legitimate transaction. Finished. 
and that's the way you open it for people to do applications. Now, that's going to cause some problems for adoptions, especially in countries where a microtransaction is not a euro, it's a rupee. Um, and for that, we're going to need to build higher level ar uh, algorithms. Let's see, over here. Hi, Andres. Uh, Sebastian Hello. Pichu, Epicenter. How are you doing? Hey. Uh, thanks for coming to Paris. Thank um, you. So I had a question regarding usage, and specifically all these great properties of Bitcoin uh, that you described and that I fully agree with. Uh, if, you know, if you look back, and you've been in the ecosystem much longer than I have, um, in recent years, um, there has been a shift from in the startup community, specifically from Bitcoin startups trying to push adoption, push usage of Bitcoin, uh, trying to promote uh, the use of Bitcoin as a payment system. And in the recent you know, 12 to 24 months, we've seen that shift over to blockchain for enterprise, etc. Mm -hmm. um, I'm convinced that Bitcoin is a great uh, currency and has great social value, has great economic value, and all these things that you uh, that you mentioned in your talk. Um, what needs to happen in order for that hockey stick curve adoption that we've been um, wanting to happen, uh, waiting to happen in the last two, three, four years? What, what, what needs to happen in order for that to occur? That's a great question. So I think what we find with entrepreneurialism in general is that the most important factor when you're doing a startup is timing. Right? And we saw this with the early web, we saw this with early internet companies. You know, in, in 1998, some people said, oh, let's deliver supermarket food by web. And those companies failed, right? pretty badly, in fact. That doesn't mean the idea failed. The idea had happened. It just happened 15 years later. And the reason was that you have to wait until the density of adoption can allow you to set up a market. And there's different types of markets. There's markets that are one-sided, there's markets that are two-sided, and there's markets that are many-to-many. -many. So let's think about that for a second. What's the primary application of Bitcoin that has succeeded so far? Speculation. <laughs> How many people does it take for someone to speculate in Bitcoin? One, the speculator. You don't need, you don't care if your neighbors have Bitcoin, accept Bitcoin, don't accept Bitcoin. In fact, it's probably better if they don't. It's probably better if they don't figure it out for another couple of years, and you'll get the price premium of having to deal with a difficult technology early enough to be a speculator. So speculator is a one-sided market. It's almost a zero-sided market. You only need one participant. So that's the most successful application. Now, if you want a two-sided market, then you've got to have buyers and sellers simultaneously present in the same vicinity with access to Bitcoin or the desire to own Bitcoin. Right? That's harder to bootstrap. So we find that successful in areas like online commerce. Because if an online commerce, I make a product available and I say, hey, I'll take Bitcoin, I don't need people to be here. I just need to be on the internet. And if there's someone on the internet who has Bitcoin and someone on the internet who wants Bitcoin, commerce happens, great. But if you try to do that at your local bakery, and there's three people in a five-mile radius who have Bitcoin, and one bakery in a five-mile radius that wants Bitcoin, you don't have a market. Right? You're just going to get frustration. So that market takes a lot longer to bootstrap. Remember when Facebook started? Right? And then day one, they launched globally, and everybody signed up? Oh no, I'm remembering it wrong. That's not how it happened. What they did was they went to Stanford, and they picked one building. And they knocked on everybody's door until they got everybody in that one building signed up on Facebook. And that's the only place you could do it. And once that was successful, they got five more buildings and they signed up the entire campus. So now, when you went to Stanford, everyone you knew was on the Stanford Facebook. And now it was useful because you had the density. So they bootstrapped the market by creating a small focused group, right? And then they went and expanded. So you're going to see this happen with Bitcoin. You can't just bootstrap a retail market and say, hey, we accept Bitcoin in the DCM arrondissement. There's one bakery, it accepts Bitcoin. World, come visit. And nobody shows up. Right? Um, we're not going to see those types of retail applications. And part of the reason we're not going to see those types of retail applications is this. How many people in this room have a debit card? 
maybe I should have asked this the other way around. Right? Okay, so do you really need Bitcoin? No. You don't. Not to shop at the bakery. You've got cash, you've got credit cards, you've got bank accounts, you've got tap to pay, swipe to pay, Venmo, PayPal, blah, blah, blah. You've got everything. Great. You don't need Bitcoin. And the reason you don't need Bitcoin is because you live among the maybe 6% of the world that has enormous financial privilege. <laughs> You need Bitcoin because you understand it ideologically. That's very different from, my children will starve, I can't send them to school, my generation's wealth has been destroyed by my government. I saw that in Greece. Twice in my lifetime, my parents lost everything. You go to Argentina and I talk about Bitcoin, they know why. And to them, it's not theoretical. It's not theoretical at all. So what do you need for Bitcoin adoption? Well, you need to, to be needed. You need to have applications that are needed. And the basic form of paying is an application that is needed by four and a half billion people around the world who have very little access to banking and can't do cross-border transactions. And I don't think any of them are in this room. Right? Now that's the majority of the human population, but it's going to take a decade to bring this technology. Um, do you need Bitcoin if you live in a country that's suffering from hyperinflation? If there's a banking crisis, if there's currency controls, if you're trying to get your money out, if your government, you know, occasionally throws people out of airplanes because they disagreed with them? Yes, all of these things happened in Argentina in the last 20 years. They get it. So we're not going to see the bootstrapping of Bitcoin for retail payments among affluent, connected, banked people. First, we're going to see many of the unbanked dealing with some of the difficult problems they have. In my opinion, the biggest application today, other than basic infrastructure, exchanges, wallets, transfer systems, internet service providers for Bitcoin, basically, the equivalent. Other than that, the biggest application today is remittances. So remittances means if you're an immigrant and you're sending money home, and Western Union takes 9%, plus 3% on the exchange rate spread, plus another 5% on the destination in taxes, fees, and transmission, then you need Bitcoin. Then Bitcoin is the difference between you keeping 15% of your money. Right? That's a tax on poverty. That's a tax on immigration. And so that's an area where people will go through the most ridiculous steps. You tell them, listen, it takes 26 steps to set up a Bitcoin wallet, and you have to read this very complicated manual, and you won't understand any of it. And they go, yeah, for 15% of my wealth? Sure, <laughs> I'll do it. Right? Now, if you tell someone in uh, Paris, listen, next time you go buy your morning café and croissant, instead of just going tap woo, with the Apple Pay, Read this 26-page manual, go through these 70,000 steps, and then you'll have Bitcoin, and the world will be a better place. They're like, you're crazy. So we have to understand who the audience is. And the audience is very difficult to see from this perspective, because we assume that people have these things. The truth is, two and a half billion people in the world have zero access to banking. They live in completely cash and barter-based societies. Four and a half billion people have very limited access to banking in a single currency with no ability to send or receive money across borders or with very expensive fees and very difficult requirements. You go to the United States, 18% of the population has no bank account. That's 60 million people. You'd think it was less. Many of those are undocumented immigrants. Others are poor people who lack documentation. Others are people who simply, if they try to walk into the bank, they'll probably be arrested because of how they look. Right? If you're homeless, if you're illiterate, if you're completely uneducated, you walk into a bank, it's a terrifying place. You're not going to be able to figure out all of the ways to open a bank account. That's 60 million people. In this country, it's actually a bit higher than 18 uh, percent. But you go to places like the Philippines, Indonesia, or Brazil, you're looking at 75 percent unbanked. Right? So that's where Bitcoin is going to succeed, in my opinion. All right, let's go over to this side for questions. Over here. You've been talking about the need for Bitcoin, and so that's the demand side. 
what are the plans to make the supply of Bitcoin grow until it uh, satisfies those 80% of people who are bankless? Because um, 10 billion in value is less than 1% of 1% of the need, uh, I'm talking only about physical needs. Right. Uh, so Bitcoin's monetary policy is very specific. It's designed to simulate precious metals. So it's a system of restricted supply without fractional reserve. Right? It's a fully backed currency where you have 20 million, 21 million coins is the maximum that will ever be created. Now, if you hear that, you say 21 million coins, how can you possibly fit a world economy in that? The point is Bitcoin is not a traditional currency. It's a programmable currency. And that 21 million is subdivided by eight decimal points, which means that you have a hundred million smaller units in every Bitcoin. So one Bitcoin has a hundred million Satoshi, which is the smallest unit you can have. We can divide it even further than that. So you can cut it into smaller and smaller pieces. So if you talk about it in terms of 21 quadrillion monetary units, 21 quadrillion monetary units could fit the world economy as it is today, right? Um, with a with a value of a tenth of a dollar approximately per unit for 21 quadrillion. That would give you 210 uh, trillion dollars, or do the math. Well, in reverse, exactly. So, if you cut it up, what happens is that you have a deflationary effect. So, you have a relatively fixed supply with increasing demand. What that does is it drives the price of the currency up. And so, deflation is a very scary thing, especially if you're an economist. And the reason deflation is a scary thing is because in in classical economics we now deal with currencies that are fractional reserve. Right? So what are the conditions under which you have deflation in a fractional reserve currency? So you have a government that has the ability to create infinite supply. What does it take for the demand to so far collapse below the supply that even infinite supply creates deflation? And the answer is simple. You have to have a catastrophic collapse in demand not just a recession, a full-blown depression. So whenever you see in systems of money where you can create, you can just keep printing money, right? Inflation is a problem. Deflation is not a problem, right? Because if you can keep printing money, someone's going to spend it. That's not the problem. Why would no one spend it? Because the economy has collapsed completely. So the only places in the world where we see deflation as a monetary phenomenon, are places where you have a catastrophic collapse in, in demand. Japan is a great example of that, now in its 20th year of deflation. And we've seen it in a few other countries, which, where just before they go into the hyperinflation, they first dip into a deflationary period. Everybody keeps their money under their mattress. Then they have a slight increase in the positive sentiment. The money comes out into the market again, and then you go Weimar Republic. <laughs> hundred billion trillion marks for a cup of coffee. <laughs> right? um, so deflation is bad if deflation is a monetary phenomenon where you have infinite supply. But it's not necessarily bad if the supply is restricted. Let me give you an example of deflation we all like. How many people here have a phone that costs the same as the phone they bought ten years ago? How many here have a phone that's less expensive for the same capabilities as the phone they bought 10 years ago? We all do, right? So you get 10 times more processing power, 10 times more memory than 2 years ago. Yes? My first cell phone was slightly bigger than this microphone. Um, it had 18 minutes of talk time. 18 minutes before the battery would run out. And I paid almost 1,000 pounds sterling to buy it. And today, this thing runs for 20 some hours, has more processing than the first supercomputers, actually more processing than a thousand of the first supercomputers, and it cost me about 600 dollars. And guess what that's called? Deflation. 
That's deflation in action. That's where my money buys more product, has more value in a market where you have deflation. Deflation is great. With laptops, we love it. With falling prices for uh, products, we love it. For um, businesses that are efficient, we love it. When deflation is caused not by a collapse in demand, but by improvements in efficiency and constrained supply, we love it. So deflation is not really necessarily a problem. But on the other hand, we don't know. Uh, one of the things we see in uh, cryptocurrencies is there's a lot of competition for the monetary model. If you don't like Bitcoin's monetary model, you can find others that have different models with higher levels of inflation. The monetary policy is a very interesting characteristic to me because in a world where every other currency is printed to infinity, this is the only one that isn't. So that's a good thing. Um, at least it's a different thing, so it's counter-correlated. Um, and to an investor, that's a very interesting thing to have something that is counter-correlated. I can always get inflation-based currencies. Um, when you see things like Brexit happen, or you see um, collapses in the yuan or sudden devaluations in the yuan, three things go up: yen, because it's deflating, <laughs> right? Gold and Bitcoin. Fancy that. That's a weird situation going on in monetary politics, because everything else is moving in the same direction. And the only three things that are moving in the opposite direction are Japanese yen, gold, and Bitcoin. So I'm not an economist. Again, I'll disclaim that, and hope I covered a bit of that. All right, on this side, yes. Hi, Andres. Hello. Uh, I would like to know uh, what do you think about art forks for a way, as a way to evolve protocols in blockchains? Uh, what do we think of hard forks as a way to evolve protocols? So um, I'm a big fan of automotive crash tests, right? I'm a big fan. I think one of the reasons we have safe automobiles is because of automotive crash tests. I'm also a big fan of using dummies in the automotive crash tests, where I'm not the passenger, right? Now, if someone said, we have a new bus, everybody get on, we don't know how it works, but we're going to run a crash test to find out. <laughs> Jump on. <laughs> That's how I feel about hard forks. I would rather not be in the crash test <laughs> when the crash test is happening. Um, hard forks are dangerous. They're difficult. They're complex, and they have unintended behaviors. Hard forks bring together the nexus of politics, community response, independent economic agents, self-interest, monetary policy, and technology. And any one of those can go wrong. Uh, in a recent example, we saw in Ethereum a hard fork, and the hard fork technologically was perfect. Perfect. Economically, politically, in terms of the community and self-interested actors, uh, not so perfect. 10% of the economic activity community hash rate ended up forking off to a separate coin, and now there's two systems with competing interests and competing designs. I would rather not see that in Bitcoin. Um, so I'm a bit skeptical of this being used as the mechanism to rapidly iterate and mature the protocol. But that's one of the design trade-offs that's different about Ethereum. So Ethereum is its design trade-off is because of its model, it needs to iterate a lot more to reach the same level of security maturity as Bitcoin. Because it has a larger attack surface, a larger exposure surface. And so it's going to go through a lot more hard forks. Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? It depends what you're trying to use it for. Um, I don't think it makes for very good sound money um, and for a robust platform. But uh, that's a trade-off that allows it to actually have much more flexible application development. And so I'm interested in that. I think that's the choice I would make for Ethereum. It's not the choice I would make for Bitcoin. Does that help? Bit of an esoteric topic. All right, who's got a question over here? And Alexander, you tell me when you want me to stop. Okay, I'll just keep going until I drop. Two questions that are both... Two questions. Okay, fine. You see, deflation already. 
Thank you. Uh, but both of them are risks against Bitcoin. The first one is technological. Uh, recently, NIST, instead of starting promoting migration from SHA-2 to SHA-3, said it is time to start thinking about migrating to post-quantum cryptography, the one that is going to weaken um, Sorry, the, the, the post-quantum cryptography that is going to weaken uh, asymmetric cryptography yes. and SHA-2. And um, so we are talking about the attack of 51%, but in that case it will be in 10 or 20 years, attack of 99%. Because one guy, one bad actor with a quantum uh, computer is going to be uh, spending much less energy, and much less electricity than anyone else, and having 99% of the uh, hashing capability. So but if it's 99%, it's not an attack. You realize that? Yeah. He is monopoly. And, um, well, he, not he, necessarily. He owns okay. the, the Bitcoin. And, well, uh, and, so, we, uh, uh, and so, ju ju very quickly. That's so, the so first question. Okay. Yes, so we changed the, the algorithm. We put a uh, proof of stake, uh, things like that. And second question is also the corporations and the governments that you started with. They are not going to be happy with Bitcoin. They oh, are no. So... Bitcoin will have to respond. The community will have to. Any ideas about this, please? Okay, great. First question. Um, so quantum cryptography and um, more, more specifically quantum cryptanalysis will allow at some point quantum computing to exceed the abilities of current cryptographic algorithms. Listen, that's part of being in cryptography. Cryptography, you're looking at 20 to 30 years of usable life cycle for uh, an algorithm before it gets exceeded by current technology, uh, new developments in mathematics, etc. Et um, I think the system within Bitcoin is such that it can be upgraded. Both the uh, signing algorithm and the hashing algorithm can be switched out for other algorithms, if we think that it, there is a need to do that. So quantum cryptography represents a threat only if it is unevenly distributed in commercial sectors. Right? Um, if quantum cryptography is available only to one actor, and not all the actors, most likely, if quantum cryptography or quantum cryptanalysis and quantum computing is available only to one actor, that actor is a state actor. That actor is going to not use it for Bitcoin. What they're going to do is keep it secret and use it for the time when they're threatened by a cryptographically secured nuclear weapon or whatever, some crazy idea like that. Uh, certainly, what we've seen with intelligence agencies that have computing advantages, they don't use it until there is a dire emergency to use it, and Bitcoin isn't the dire emergency. Because once you use it and everybody knows you have it, then all of the algorithms get changed and you have one shot. Right? So better make it good. If quantum computing is available broadly, then all the miners upgrade to quantum computers, and we do shantum, sh shantum qua, quantum sha, <laughs> qua shantum, sha quantum, something like that. I, I don't know. Uh, we're probably going to change the algorithm. Um, if there is enough availability of quantum computing, that 99% of the mining capacity switches over. Uh, the chance that that's going to be controlled by one person is pretty slim. In fact, what you're going to end up doing is just switching everybody to running SHA on quantum computers, and then it's just the same as when we went from FPGA to ASIC. Um, we're going to be looking at a different order of magnitude or several orders of magnitude in improvement. But keep in mind, running a quantum computer is neither free uh, nor easy, right? Um, it's going to be expensive in terms of energy and cooling costs, etc. And the electricity that you're not spending doing SHA, you're spending keeping the thing at you know 200 degrees uh, below zero. So um, all of these things add up. We don't know what the economics will be. I try not to solve problems until problems are up, and I think Bitcoin is very much a system where we solve problems when it's necessary to solve problems. So we'll see. Um, as for the second thing, corporations and governments are not going to be happy. Sure, they're not. I'm sure they won't be happy. Um, I believe this is the place where, at some point, the people decided that the king wouldn't be happy too much with their choices, and kings were not happy anywhere. And yet, the revolution happened anyway. Bitcoin is a technological revolution, and it's a global system. The bottom line is that corporations and governments adapt. and They adapt to new technologies, and they have been adapting to new technologies for hundreds 
of years, sometimes thousands of years, and they're going to adapt to Bitcoin. Because Bitcoin is neither the worst thing that's ever happened in technology, nor the most insurmountable thing that's ever happened in technology. And there could be far worse cryptocurrencies than Bitcoin, uh, from the perspective of government. Um, the fact that governments are not going to be happy really doesn't concern me much, because Bitcoin is a system that does not require their permission, their approval, or their cooperation, or their endorsement, or their assistance. It is a system that simply exists. And we can deny that fact, but it still exists. We can pretend it's going away, but it isn't. And we can talk all day about whether governments should or shouldn't regulate Bitcoin. But the really difficult question is whether governments can regulate Bitcoin. And the answer is simple. They can't. They can't regulate Bitcoin itself. They can regulate at the edge. They can regulate the behavior of some of the users of Bitcoin if they're within their borders and under certain circumstances. But the truth is that they can't really regulate Bitcoin itself. Um, so governments and corporations are going to have to adapt, and I think that's one of the features of Bitcoin, not one of its bugs. I think that's one of the reasons why Bitcoin is so exciting to a lot of people, is because it introduces a new choice. It's not saying you can't do the old way. It's not saying you can't do hierarchical corporation and organization. You can't do uh, restricted within one border jurisdiction payment systems. You can't do banking with a central bank. You can do all of those things. But we're going to also do this. And we'll see which one is better. And, and that's really the, the bottom line. All right, okay. do we have a question over here? Last question. Last question. Okay, so you're under a lot of pressure to make it a good question. What do you think about the fungibility of a Bitcoin? Uh, <laughs> yes, somebody suggested that in, I should end my, um, my talk with Liberté, Egalité, Fungibilité. <laughs> Um, that's an insider joke for us Bitcoiners. Um, fungibility. Uh, so first of all, does anybody? Okay, who does not understand the word fungibility or has, is not familiar with it? Great. Let's talk about fungibility. So one euro is one euro is one euro. If you receive a euro, it doesn't matter where it came from. It doesn't matter if two people before you it was stolen. It doesn't matter if two people before you it was robbed from a bank. It's a euro. Upon presentation, that euro is the same as every other euro. And no one can say, I'll take this euro, but I won't take that euro. And, and that is not simply a matter of practice, that is a matter of law. And this law was settled in the 16th century, where someone said, actually, that's my euro and it was stolen. And they took someone to court who was not the person who stole it, it was the person who received it several times later, and said, that is stolen property. Okay, it wasn't a euro, it was a franc, or something like that. I think it was a pound sterling, actually. Um, and it was taken to court, and the court said, you can't do that. So Money is the one type of property that cannot be stolen and then recovered by the original owner. If you steal money, right, you can't say, that's my money, give it back to people later. You can say it to the person who stole it. But you can't just walk into a shop and say, I'm going to sue you because you have the money that was stolen from me. That's fungibility. The reason we have fungibility in the currency is very, very simple. Otherwise, it wouldn't work. If every time you received a euro, you had to open a list or a database and say, okay, serial number 13133772, is that a good euro or a bad euro? Is it a medium euro? A kind of naughty euro? Is it a bit cocaine-y? <laughs> Is it a bit terroristy? Because then it's not one euro. It's 0 0.72 euros. It's 0 0.76 euros. Oh, this one's a bit too cocaine-y. It's 0 0.53 euros in value, right? Oh, this one was touched by Elton John. It's 1.6 euros. We don't accept that as a model for using currency. And the reason we don't accept it is because it wouldn't work. If you had to check the provenance of every system of money that you receive, you couldn't make currency work. And the reason you couldn't make it work is not just because you would have to track a database that had to be perfect and always updated with every coin in it, but the most important thing is that no euro would be worth one euro. Every euro would be worth a different value weighted by how liquid it is, how circulable it is, 
whether you can use it. Right? So if you can use it, but some places, and not use it other places, automatically its value drops. And now you have to keep track of what the value of one euro is in euro. Right? That's fungibility. It's the uh, understanding by law, understanding by practice, and technological fact that every unit of currency is indistinguishable, or is treated as indistinguishable from every other unit of currency. Um, Bitcoin is fungible-ish. <laughs> Somewhat fungible. Um, in Bitcoin, you can trace the provenance of every coin. By practice, by custom, we don't do that. We are beginning to see some companies do that. That is a problem. If you go to Bitstamp... Coinbase, Zappo, and you say, here's my Bitcoin, and they say, well, three Bitcoins ago, or three transactions ago, this came from Bitfinex, and we're going to freeze your account, you have a problem. Right? So that's fungibility being destroyed right now in Bitcoin. However, at the same time, we're seeing a lot of technologies being developed to improve fungibility. Because fungibility also has to do with privacy and anonymity, which are really important characteristics that we're trying to strengthen and at the same time preserve within Bitcoin. And that means ensuring that transactions are private, that you don't know who is who in a transaction, that you don't know what value is being transmitted. There's a number of technologies being developed for that which make Bitcoin extremely private, where you can't even see the value of the transactions being made. You can't tell who is the sender and who is the recipient. You can't tell how much money is being paid. And it really fixes fungibility, because you simply can't track coins from one to another. And this is the point where most people go, but what about criminals? But what about drug dealers? But what about terrorists? Aren't they going to use this to do that? Yes. They're going to use this to do that. And if you didn't do it in Bitcoin, they're going to use another cryptocurrency that already does that. There's half a dozen available that already do that. And if you say you can't use those, I'll invent two. I'll write one this weekend that can do that. The bottom line is that criminals will use technology even if it's illegal. <laughs> wow. Incredible idea. And so um, banning technology only affects the people who aren't criminals. Is this, this is wild philosophy, I know. Uh, <laughs> so um, you can't actually ban technology, especially open source technology, because the only people who will be affected by the ban are the innocent and the idiots. The people who couldn't figure out how to use the technology that actually allowed them to hide the sources of their money. So fungibility is something we're fixing in Bitcoin because what it does is it helps everybody the innocent, the well-meaning, the people who pay their taxes and want to educate their children and feed their children and buy homes and cars and operate in society, protect their privacy from predators, from corporations, from tyrannical governments, from oppressive governments. And so we need to do privacy for them. And criminals will also use it. That's my answer for fungibility. Thank you so much. That was a good last question. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.